Here we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to dive right into Chapter 5, which is the digestive system. And this is Chapter 15 of your textbook. So just starting right into it, there's really no um, preemptive discussion other than, there always is something, uh, other than the fact that most students think that this chapter is easier than it actually is. Um, because most of us understand the digestive system. We understand that we eat stuff, our body uses those materials, and then we poop out what we don't need, right? So for the most part, we think we know it. But there's a lot of details and a lot of physiology and a lot of enzymes involved in the digestive system, and that's what we're going to cover in this lecture. So here's our objectives. We'll flip through them because they're already in your chapter folder. And let's start with the basics, the overall system interactions. Our digestive system works in coordination with our respiratory and urinary systems, um, all overall providing growth uh, nutrients for growth and maintenance, repair, et cetera, for the rest of the body. The respiratory system works in conjunction with the cardiovascular system to supply all the oxygen and then remove all the carbon dioxide. And the urinary system removes all the organic waste. So all of our body systems are working together. All of our cells need oxygen and nutrients, and all of our cells produce waste. So between the urinary system, respiratory system, and digestive system, all of that stuff is going into the cells and is being used by the cells, and the cells are getting rid of stuff, which is then going into the urinary or respiratory system. So you see this kind of flow of nutrients from the um, digestive system into our uh, cardiovascular system, carbon dioxide and oxygen into our cardiovascular system, all of these things going into our tissue cells and waste products going into our urinary system. That would be nice if this diagram was labeled for you. This up here is representing the lungs. This is our peripheral tissues, any cells of our body. Here you have our urinary system, and here we have our um, digestive system, all in the middle, communicating and coordinating with this cardiovascular system. So let's talk about the digestive system as a whole. It's composed of what we call the digestive tract. That's the tube that all the food passes through and the accessory organs. The digestive tract or the GI tract, sometimes it's also called the alimentary canal. It's a muscular tube. It has a mucous membrane on the inside. It starts at the mouth, ends at the anus. It passes through the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestine. So mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then the anus. That's the root through the body. All of the accessory organs are secreting products like enzymes and hormones into that digestive tract. So here you see them, and you can also see the accessory organs right here, like the salivary gland, the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Food doesn't pass through those areas, but those organs have an important role in the digestive process as well. So let's talk about this digestive tract. It's lined with ridges and folds. All of those folds and ridges help to allow for expansion as well as increase the ability to absorb. They're coated with something called a mesentery. A mesentery is a, a uh, extra sheet of connective tissue within the peritoneal cavity. It's a real R tissue. It provides an access route for blood vessels and all the nerves and lymphatics to come into those organs. It also helps to stabilize and attach those organs to themselves and to the body cavity walls because there's no bones holding these organs in place. So they're all kind of suspended in this spider web network of connective tissue, we call them the mesenteries. The uh, mesentery also prevents the intestines from becoming entangled. So there are several layers to the digestive tract. This resembles a little bit the layers of our blood vessels. Remember, we had the tunica externa, the tunica media, and the tunica intima. We have the same type of layers here. We have a mucosal inner lining. This is just a mucous membrane. This has glandular secretions right, all associated with it. Then you have a submucosa, so it's the innermost is mucosa, then the submucosa. Submucosa is dense irregular connective tissue, and there's lots of blood vessels here. Then you have the muscularis externa. This is our smooth muscle layers. The smooth muscle is going in two, two directions. It's circular, and it's longitudinal, so it's going to help propel and squeeze. Then you have the outermost layer, kind of like the tunica externa. This is the serosa. This is that outer skin of our digestive tract. If I had a stomach just sitting on the table and you looking at it, that would be the serosa that you see. There is no serosa lining in the oral cavity, in the pharynx, in the esophagus, or on the rectum. So serosa is only referring to the stomach and small and large intestines. 
So here you see what I mean. The mesentery is this connective tissue suspending our organs in place and holding uh, the blood vessels in place. That inner lining has lots of folds and creases on it for increased surface area for absorption and expansion. That's the mucosa. Deep to the mucosa, you see this area where there's blood vessels. That's our submucosa. Then you can see those two muscular layers of the muscularis externa. Again, they're circular and longitudinal. And then the outer skin or serosa. So let's talk about the mucosal components. It's epithelium, right? It's a covering and lining, so it's epithelium. Uh, it's simple columnar for the most part. There are villi that increase the surface area for absorption of nutrients. The lamina propria, where that epithelium attaches to is a real or connective tissue and that's where all the blood vessels and uh, nerve endings and lymphatics are and there's also a small layer of muscularis mucosa this is another layer of smooth muscle uh, to help kind of move that inside of the um, mucosal lining so here you see the muscularis externa which is different from the muscularis mucosa this is kind of a zoomed in view of our the lining of our digestive tract these superficial epithelial cells they're all columnar cells they're arranged in these little projections called villi and those villi are there to help increase surface uh, surface area for increased absorption as well as secretion of stomach uh, and, and intestinal juices enzymes hormones etc Deep to this epithelial layer, you have our submucosa, that's where all of our blood vessels are, and then you have our muscularis externa with those two layers of muscle, circular and longitudinal, and then the serosa is this outside layer. The myenteric plexus is a branch of the uh, autonomic nervous system. There's just a, a bunch of nerve endings there so that your um, subconscious is aware of where the food is in your digestive tract, so control those um, reflexes that are associated with the digestive tract. So let's talk about the nerve plexus. So overall, there, you, the, your digestive tract is controlled at the local level. Your brain, your cerebrum has so much information going on, right? Like you're thinking about what you have to do after you're done listening to this lecture and, and you're trying to process all the stuff that I'm telling you. You're thinking about what you're going to make for dinner or breakfast or whatever. So you have all these things going on in your brain your cerebrum does not need to be aware of the fact that your little sphincter muscle at the end of your stomach is expelling food into the small intestine, right? So all that stuff happens at the local level and does not come into our conscious awareness. So most of those nerves stay down in that area. They, they're making up the submucosal plexus, which is a more superficial uh, nerve bundle. This is innervating the mucosa, submucosa, and then the myenteric plexus, which is in between our muscular layers, helping to control that peristalsis motion, that propulsion through the digestive tract. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. So let's talk about the actions of these smooth muscles. The smooth muscles are forming sheets and bundles around these tissues. They can form around blood vessels to help regulate blood flow. They're typically ring-shaped and can regulate movement along passageways. And as we said, our digestive tract has two layers of smooth muscle, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. So here you see them, uh, our circular layer, our longitudinal layer. And... These two, two muscle layers work together to do something called peristalsis. Peristalsis is the propulsion of the food through the digestive tract by this muscularis um, externa. So food enters the digestive tract is something we call a bolus. You chew it up, it mixes it with your digestive enzymes, and we no longer technically call it food anymore. We call it a bolus. The bolus is this chewed up wad of food that's mixed with your saliva kind of gross, right? This bolus is propulsed or propelled through your digestive system by this muscularis externa and the process that does it is called peristalsis. So you have your food coming in, your circular muscles are squeezing, kind of pushing it forward, the longitudinal muscles are contracting, elongating it, and it's kind of inching forward slowly, slowly. Just like that. Segmentation is another movement that's performed by our muscularis externa. This is a series of contractions that, are, that produce a mixing or churning, and it, again, it's called segmentation. There's no forward propulsion. It's kind of like peristalsis will occur, and the bolus moves forward, moves forward, and then it stops and mixes for a little bit. 
and then it moves forward, moves forward through peristalsis, and then segmentation happens, and that mixing uh, happens again. So the longitudinal muscles contract, the circular muscles can contract, and this, again, is just producing a localized mixing or churning, and we call that segmentation. You can pause the video here and go back and review this section. Let's talk about the subdivisions of our digestive tract. You have the oral cavity, which include the teeth and tongue, the pharynx, which is the throat, the esophagus, which is transporting that food that has been swallowed down into the stomach, the stomach itself, which is the site of chemical and mechanical processing, this mixing, churning, digestive enzymes all being mixed together, the small intestine, which has lots of enzymatic uh, di uh, digestion going on and major site of absorption, all of the nutrients coming into the blood at this location. And then the large intestine, which is where all of that water that was in your bolus is now getting sucked back into your body so you're not getting rid of all that water and you're compacting all of the indigestible materials. In other words, you're making poop in your large intestine. Here you see all of those structures. Uh, intentionally left these blank so that you can fill in the functions if you like. A little bit of study practice there for you. Uh, overall functions of our digestive tract, it also is there to protect the surrounding tissues. We have things like ingestion, mechanical processing, digestion, secretion, absorption, compaction, and defecation all happening in the digestive tract. So it's not just, you know, eating and pooping in our digestive tract. We have these specific functions that we like to give them all names. Again, like I said, most of us think we know the digestive tract. We do, but we're gonna give everything a more official name. So ingestion is the first thing. That's food coming into the body, going into the mouth. Mechanical processing, that's the chewing or shredding of food in the oral cavity. This is also the mixing and churning of food once it gets into the stomach. The bolus, I should say, not the food. And then digestion is the chemical and enzymatic breakdown. This is typically occurring within our stomach and within the first few parts of our small intestine. Secretion is performed all along the digestive tract. Um, secretion of enzymes, secretion of hormones, etc. Absorption is when those molecules which are in our digestive tract are now taken across the epithelial membrane into our blood. So they're going into our blood or into our lymphatics and entering the body's body cavities instead of just staying in the digestive tract. Compaction and defecation is uh, basically the creation of feces, which is eliminated through the process of pooping, right? The process of defecation. So let's talk specifically about the oral cavity. It contains the tongue, saliva, salivary glands, and our teeth. It's lined by our oral mucosa, which is stratified squamous epithelium. The process of chewing is called mastication. And the whole purpose of masticating, the whole purpose of chewing that food up is so the food can become smaller and the enzymes can attack uh, with greater efficiency because there's an increased surface area on those smaller items. Digestion of carbohydrates and lipids begins in the mouth, begins in the oral cavity. The superior boundary of our oral cavities are hard and soft palates. The inferior boundary is the floor, right, and the, and the underlying muscles of, of our tongue. Anterior lateral boundaries are our lips cheeks, and then the body, which is the mobile portion of the tongue. The posterior boundary is the uvula, the little hanging ball thing in the back of your mouth. My son, uh, he's only five years old, but since he was about two, he knew what a uvula was. Obviously, I'm an A&P teacher, right? So um, he said to my husband one day, hey, daddy, can I see your uvula? And my husband said, uh, I don't think I have one of those. My husband's not an A&P guy. <laughs> um, he is a mechanic, so he, he was kind of thrown off when my son asked him to see his uvula. Anyways, that's the little hanging ball. Uh, and the posterior boundary also includes the root or the fixed portion of the tongue. Here you see all of those structures. Again, for the, my purposes in this class, I'm not going to give you a labeled diagram or an unlabeled diagram. Your lab instructor may. So the vestibule is just a space between your lips, like or right here, that's a vestibule. Um, the lingual frenulum is attaching the tongue to the floor of the oral cavity, this little thing at the bottom of your tongue. And then you have the pharyngeal arches, which are on either side of the uvula. They're in the upper uh, part of your throat back there. Your tongue is manipulating the food. It secretes lingual lipase, which begins the process of uh, lipid digestion. The gingivae or gums are basically holding your teeth in place. 
Here you can see some of those terms I mentioned. Much more attractive looking at it on a diagram than in an actual mouth. Ah. <laughs> Not always fun to look inside a mouth, unless you are a dental hygienist or wanting to be a dental hygienist, and then you might like that. Um, you could pause the video here, go back and review these three questions. We're going to keep moving. Let's talk about teeth. Speaking of dental hygienists, uh, the bulk of the tooth is composed of dentin. That's a mineralized matrix of the bone. There's no cells there. The pulp cavity is the inside part of your tooth. The crown of your tooth is what you see. The neck of your tooth is that little boundary between the crown and the root, and the root itself is below the gum line, um, and it, it's held in little sockets called alveolus. The alveolus are the little tooth chambers. The enamel is the ve very outer covering. It covers the dentin of the crowns, the hardest biologically manufactured substance ever. In, in all animals, enamel is the hardest. Uh, it requires calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D in order to resist decay and breakdown. Uh, there's a shallow groove around the base of the neck, and this allows for the gingivae to uh, kind of dig in there and block any bacteria from getting into the deeper tissues. And cementum covers the dentin uh, of the root. So it was, it's very much less resistant than enamel um, because it's already buried in your gingivae, so it's, you don't really need that much protection there. All your teeth are held in place from the periodontal ligament, it's uh, collagen fibers, and then the root canal is the passageway for blood vessels to get in and get into the pulp, where there's lots of cells in there living and dividing and producing all that calcium to maintain your teeth. So there you see, this inner pulp cavity is made of living cells, and then the dentin covered by the enamel, and the cementum, which is in the root area, covering our dentin. Um, that's sitting in the socket. All right, there are four distinct types of teeth. There are incisors. These are blade teeth. These are the ones in the front of the mouth. These are for clipping and cutting. This is what you bite with. Your cuspids are your canines. They are more for tearing or slashing. Obviously, in humans, we don't really tear and slash our food that much, but large carnivorous creatures like lions and tigers and bears, oh my, they all do that, which is why they have very large cuspids. Bicuspids or premolars, these have a flattened crown. They have some prominent ridges, so they're from mashing and grinding. They have one or two roots, and then the molars are very large, very prominent ridges. Again, more crushing and grinding, and these guys can be huge with three or more roots. Here you see them. And if you've ever seen an actual tooth out of its socket, they're really big. You look at it and you're like, huh, you know, you only think your tooth is this big, but they go way up in there. They're rooted in place pretty strong. Uh, not like uh, children's teeth when they lose them. They obviously don't have a root attached to them because that's, that's why they fall out because the, the roots have decayed. Um, but adult teeth are very, very big. You have something called primary dentition and secondary dentition. Your primary dentition are your deciduous teeth. This is the first set of teeth that you have. Uh, you know, after babies are born and they, after a few months and they start popping these teeth out, which can be a very painful process for them and they cry a lot. Um, these are sometimes also called milk teeth or baby teeth. Typically about two years of life is once they, is, is when they finish growing all of their uh, primary teeth and there's 20 of them. There's five on each side of the upper and lower jaw. So five, 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 and five, and that gets, gets you to 20 teeth. There's two incisors, one cuspid, and two molars on all of the quadrants. There you see them. And your mouth is measured by quadrants. So typically, um, you know, we'll just look at this side or this one side of the mouth. There they are. And again, you can see how deep those roots go in. It's kind of a cool picture um, of the skull. So secondary dentition is what is re being replaced or what is replacing the primary dentition, the periodontal ligaments and the roots of those primary teeth erode. And so those primary teeth fall out, as I've said. And then the three additional molars will appear on each side. And the, the third set is called the wisdom teeth because you get them once you're old and wise. Uh, total permanent teeth is 32. Most people only have 28 because most people either don't get their wisdom teeth or they have their wisdom teeth extracted. So there you see them. Those third molars are wisdom teeth. You typically get them around the age of 18 or maybe a little bit later. And they are typically removed. Um, although most, some people have them. Some people only get one. 
Um, mine are gone. I had mine pulled out when I was 16. I got mine pretty early. Uh, anyways, tooth decay is the action of bacteria in the mouth can cause this. It's not actually the bacteria that's doing the decay. The bacteria are uh, binding to your teeth, which is why you need to brush them. And then what they're doing is they're digesting all the food particles that are left on your teeth. And as they do that, they leave these little deposits called plaque, dental plaque. And with all that buildup of plaque, it can weaken the, the gums, and that's called gingivitis. So, um, or inflammation of the gingiva it can cause the erosion of gums, damage to the root, loss of your tooth. Regular brush, brushing and flossing can prevent this. And there's your review questions for the oral cavity. Let's move on to the pharynx. It's a membrane lined cavity posterior to the base of the nose and mouth. This is our throat. Pharynx is a fancy word for throat. It's continuous with the esophagus and it's the common passageway for food, liquids, and air. We saw it a little bit in our respiratory chapter last, uh, last week. Here you see the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx. Getting into the esophagus, a hollow muscular tube about 25 centimeters long, 18 inches long or so, transports food uh, and liquid from the pharynx to the stomach. The mucosa and submucosa have large folds, and again, there's no serosal lining of the esophagus. Uh, the lumen of the esophagus is closed for the most part, except when you're swallowing. So it kind of collapses and then it expands as, as food's in it. The muscularis externa um, is composed of skeletal muscles on uh, the top part because you're, you're physically in control of when you can swallow, and then the rest are all um, smooth muscles. So, so the same layers as the rest of our digestive tract, extremely thick epithelium, because there's lots of friction going on there, but again, there's no serosa. Um, there's something called an adventitia, which is anchoring the esophagus into place, into the body wall. Swallowing is the process known as deglutition. Uh, this is a complex process, believe it or not. It's initiated voluntarily, and then it goes to, the, to an automatic process. So there's three phases, the buccal phase, the pharyngeal phase, the esophageal phase. In the buccal phase, this is where your tongue, this is where you're done chewing, you're like, okay, this food is mushy, or I'm ready to finally swallow and get it out of my mouth. And so you lift your tongue, and it pushes that food back, and then the food slips down your throat. That's the buccal phase. Then the pharyngeal phase, this is now where your smooth muscle takes over. Now that you've consciously swallowed, as I just did, um, that bolus or saliva or whatever you're swallowing is going to start sliding down because of gravity and uh, is propulsed down through your esophagus through the process of peristalsis. In the esophageal phase, you have your peristalsis occurring. Notice in the pharyngeal phase what's happening to the larynx, that epiglottis is coming to cover that laryngeal opening so that the food does not go into your lungs. This is that it went down the wrong pipe thing that we all experience from time to time if we're eating and talking or eating too fast and it does go down the wrong pipe. So uh, our esophagus has sphincter muscles on it. They're just little bands of smooth muscle. Uh, there's one at the upper and lower parts of our esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter is usually contracted to prevent the backflow of anything that's in the stomach to go back up the esophagus. You can pause the video here, go back and review these three questions. Let's keep moving into the stomach. The stomach is very muscular, very expandable, and can hold up to one and a half liters when it's full. So picture a liter bottle or a two liter bottle. It's just less, a little bit less than a two liter bottle. It's a crazy amount of food, liquid food, uh, in, in that small little chamber. Once the food, the saliva, and all of the gastric juices mix in, that bolus is now called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, chyme. Very acidic, it's kind of soupy-like. Uh, the lesser curvature is the medial surface and the gradial curvature is the lateral surface connecting to mesenteries, holding it in place. The fundus is that top superior portion and the cardia is the part that's just below the esophagus, has lots and lots of mucus glands there um, to help uh, neutralize that stomach acid that may be trying to bubble up into the esophagus. The body is the large region of the stomach and the pylorus is at the very edge. This is um, the part that frequently changes shape as the stomach is mixing and churning. So here you can see some of these parts. The fundus is this top part kind of extending upward. This is when you get really full. <coughs> you have to kind of lean back and expand your chest a little bit because you just ate so much. Um, the cardiac region 
is just below the um, esophagus, as I mentioned, body, greater curvature, lesser curvature, both held in place by mesenteries, the pyloric region, etc. This is it on a cadaver. Looks a lot different than those nice color-coded pictures that we're used to in the lab books. Let's talk about some other stomach structures. You have the uh, pylorus, which consists of the antrum, the canal, and the sphincter. The antrum is the portion of the pylorus that's attached to the body of the stomach. The pyloric canal is what empties into the duodenum, into the small intestine, and the sphincter is the small muscle that's opening and closing at the end of the stomach to allow that chyme to go into the small intestine. The rugae, or ruggy, um, the ruggy are the folds within the stomach. That's going to expand to allow your stomach to hold up to 1.5 liters. There are three layers of muscularis externa in the stomach instead of just two, like there is everything everywhere else. There's a circular layer, a longitudinal layer, and the stomach also has an oblique layer. This helps to strengthen the stomach wall, and it helps with that mixing and churning that happens as the chyme is formed. So here you see all of these layers, oblique muscular layer, our circular layer, our longitudinal layer, and here you can even see those inner ruggy, which are there, again, to expand and allow for that stomach to um, hold more. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. The stomach wall is thick and muscular. Uh, it has deep folds within the mucosa, as we, as we mentioned before, but there are glands within these folds as well. The mucosa is simple columnar, and it produces a layer of mucus, and that mucus is there to protect the epithelial cells against the enzymes and the acid that's present. So here you can see these gastric glands going down into the folds of our stomach. This is all within the mucosal lining, then the submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa. Those gastric glands in the, are in the fundus and the body of the stomach. They secrete most of the acid and enzyme that's involved in our stomach activity. It's dominated by two types of cells called parietal cells and chief cells. They're secreting gastric juice very um, regularly throughout the day. It's a very acidic solution with enzymes in it. And there's also gastric glands within the pylorus. These are secreting more mucus and hormones uh, to control and coordinate the activities of the entire digestive system. So these gastric pits are smaller, shallow depressions on the in interior surface of the stomach, and they have stem cells to release more epithelial cells. So each pit is communicating with the gastric glands to um, basically coordinate the replacement of the epithelium as well as the continual uh, production of acid and enzymes. So the cells that are in these gastric glands are the parietal cells, which secrete HCl, hydrochloric acid, and also intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is a coenzyme that helps with the absorption of vitamin B12. There's also enteroendocrine cells, which produce hormones. There's also chief, chief cells, not cheap cells, chief. Chief cells produce something called pepsinogen. When pepsinogen is exposed to hydrochloric acid, it's converted into pepsin. Pepsin is an enzyme that will break down protein. There are also renin and gastric lipase that are produced in newborns. These are milk digesting enzymes. Uh, well, renin is a milk digesting enzyme. Gastric lipase is a lipid digesting enzyme, which is in our stomach. So here you see those cells within the gastric gland, all producing HCL or enzymes or hormones accordingly, all interacting. The whole purpose is to create chyme, which is this watery mixture where um, proteins and fats continue to break down. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about some modifications to our intestinal tract. The small intestine has a different composition than our stomach. It has an increased surface area um, to help expose digestive enzymes to the, the chyme that's coming through. It also um, has an increased surface area for increased absorption. So these features include something called circular folds, intestinal villi, and microvilli. The circular folds are transverse folds along the intestinal lining, kind of like the ruggy of the stomach. They're permanent features. They're mostly located in the jejunum of the small intestine, so that's the second uh, part of the small intestine. The intestinal villi are the finger-like projections. You've seen them on a couple slides already. This is covered by the epithelial cells 
and then the surface of those epithelial cells have microvilli on them to increase the surface area for absorption. Here you see the circular fold. All of the cells make up these villi, and then on the villi are, you can imagine all of these are made up of tiny cells with microvilli on top of them. So let's talk about the intestinal glands. Just like we had gastric glands, we also have intestinal glands. Intestinal glands are found at the base of the villi. There's stem cells there that divide rapidly to replace the epithelial cells on the villi themselves, constantly renewing them, um, and the shed cells will release the intracellular enzymes into the, into the, the chyme, into the digestive solution. So again, here, imagine all of these, this whole pink layer is made up of Lots and lots of little cells, and those cells have microvilli on them as well. So these intestinal villi are very complex and have an extensive capillary network. They are going to absorb the nutrients uh, directly from the digestive fluids coming through, and all of that blood that's absorbing the nutrients is going to go directly to the liver. It's going to go to, to the liver through something called the hepatic portal circulation. It's basically a bypass. Everything goes to the liver, gets filtered, the liver can clean up and take away any toxins or bacteria that might be in there, and then it goes back to the heart for normal circulation. There's also lymphatic capillaries within our intestinal villi. They're called a lacteal. These are absorbing the fatty acids. The fatty acids don't go directly into the blood, they go into the lacteal. It's going to go from the lacteals into the left subclavian um, duct, or uh, into the left subclavian vein through typical uh, lymphatic flow through the thoracic duct. Um, so the intestinal villi are basically moved back and forth by the muscularis mucosa, basically squeezing um, to move the lymph, and it overall makes absorption much more efficient. Here you see what I mean. These villi are covered in these little tiny cells, and those cells of columnar epithelium have little microvilli on top of them as well. I wish there was a picture that showed it better to you. Um, the brush border is that simple columnar epithelium, which is carpeted with the microvilli, and it has special enzymes embedded there. They're called brush border enzymes. They're basically membrane proteins that are on the surfaces of these microvilli, and they help break down materials for them to be absorbed by the epithelial cells. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. Those intestinal, the small intestine is where the majority of absorption occurs. Very little is in the stomach, very little is in this, the large intestine. It's about six meters long, and it has a relatively small diameter compared to the large intestine. The duodenum is the first section. This is receiving the chyme from the stomach. This is also re receiving the secretions from the pancreas and liver. The jejunum is where most of the chemical digestion and absorption occurs. And then the ileum ends at what we call the ileocecal valve. This is the border between the small and large intestine. And here you see the sections, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and then large intestine. The ileocecal valve would be right about here. Um, and this is where the uh, chyme will flow from our small intestine into the large intestine, go up through the uh, ascending uh, colon, through the transverse colon, through the descending colon, through the sigmoid colon, and then through the rectum. You can pause the video here, go back, and review. Let's talk about some hormones. Hormones play a huge role in regulating digestion. There's five major hormones that help regulate digestive function. Gastrin is the only one that's not secreted by the duodenum. All the other gastric activities are regulated by the duodenum. So the five hormones, gastrin, secretin, gastric inhibitory peptide, or GIP, cholecystokinine, or CCK, and vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP. Those are our five hormones involved in digestion. This slide here is showing you what they do. Gastrin is secreted by G cells. G cells are coming from the pylorus of our stomach. Basically, uh, what these cells do is increase stomach motility. So this is the the thing that's going to get our stomach kind of churning and, and mobilize all of our acid and enzymes in the stomach. Secretin is released when the chyme is arriving in the duodenum. 
The secretin's main job is to increase the bile secretion and all of the buffers from the pancreas. Because remember, as this chyme's coming from the stomach, it's going to have a very, very low pH. It's going to be relatively acidic. So the secretin is helping to not, not only get all of the um, bile from our liver and gallbladder, which is going to help emulsify fat, it's also going to help neutralize that very low pH that's coming from the stomach. GIP is secreted when fats and carbohydrates, especially glucose, enter the stomach or enter the intestine. It is going to trigger the release of <coughs> sorry, <coughs> insulin and uh, trigger the uh, other duodenal activities, um, basically increasing glucose uptake. CCK is secreted when the chyme arrives into the duodenum especially when there's lots of proteins or fats. Um, this is going to help uh, tell the pancreas to release those fat and protein digesting enzymes. And finally, VIP is stimulated all the gland secretion and dilating all of the capillaries of our intestinal tract so that absorption can occur. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. Let's talk about the large intestine. It's fairly wide and fairly short. Major functions, it can absorb um, some of the vitamins that are produced by bacteria that are living in the, the colon. It's also there for water reabsorption. That's probably one of the main functions, I would say. It's compacting the feces and storing the feces before it's removed. The parts include the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. The cecum is the pouch that's just outside of the ileum of the small intestine. It's basically collecting and storing materials. This is where compaction begins. The appendix is attached to the cecum. The appendix is a lymphoid tissue, um, and appendicitis is the inflammation of the appendix. Here you see that cecum, this extra large packet, and you can see this little uh, sphincter valve, which is where the uh, chyme enters from the small intestine. And the appendix, appendix uh, dangling off there. The colon itself is divided into four regions. I said them already, the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. The ascending and descending colon are attached to the abdominal wall. The transverse and sigmoid are suspended by the mesenteries. Ascending cola, uh, colon is going from the cecum all the way up the right margin of the peritoneal cavity. Transverse is crossing the abdomen from right to left. And then the descending moves down the left side of the body and the sigmoid is the little S-shaped, which gets the descending colon kind of snaked over to the, to the middle of the body where the rectum is. There are also fatty appendices. These are little teardrop sacs of fat that are within the serosa of the colon. Uh, the teni coli is a longitudinal bands of smooth muscle along the outer edge. Um, it's basically the outer musculus, uh, outer layer, the musculus externa. And then the holster are the little pouches that make up the um, the colon. So you can see the holstra are these little bubbles. You can see the fatty appendices, this longitudinal muscle, which makes up our tenny coli, as we call it, our cecum, ascending colon, our transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum. The rectum is the last 15 centimeters or so. It's very expandable for temporary storage of feces. Once it's stretched, that's going to trigger that defecation reflex. That's when you say, ooh, I need to go to the bathroom. Um, and any, if any veins in that area become distended, they can be called hemorrhoids. They can be internal or external, very painful and uncomfortable. Mass movements are powerful peristaltic contractions. They occur a few times a day in response to the stretching of the stomach and the duodenum. They start at the transverse colon and basically push the feces along um, to get to the descending colon. So I think I want to back up here and show you how that happens. So the ileum is secreting all of these, um, all of this chyme into the ascending colon and peristalsis is moving it up, up, up. And once it gets to about here, um, this is usually when you start eating again. This is usually when, you, when you're hungry again. And so uh, when your stomach stretches, that's going to trigger this large peristaltic wave, um, this mass movement from the transverse colon this way. So this food is going to be, or chyme, is going to be pushed this way all of a sudden. And then it drops with gravity. And that's when you say, Ooh, whoa, I need to go to the bathroom. Right? And sometimes you can feel it rumbling and moving in there, depending on what you ate or the time of day or the time of the month or whatever. So... 
Uh, you can pause the video here, go back and review these three questions. Let's talk about how digestive activity is controlled. There's neural reflexes and there's also hormones that are involved. Parasympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system through the vagus nerve is mainly responsible for producing all the gastric juice. The food in the stomach is going to stimulate more gastrin, so it's a um, positive feedback loop where you're just producing more and more and more. The chyme in the duodenum is going to trigger what we call the enterogastric reflex. This is going to inhibit the gastrin produ production and gastric contraction. So in other words, once the chyme gets into the duodenum, the stomach can shut down, right? Digestion and absorption will occur in the jejunum and the ileum. The water is reabsorbed in the large intestine, as well as vitamin K, B5, and B7. So the feces is composed of mostly water, bacteria, and a mixture of all of your undigestible materials and epithelial cells that have been shed throughout the way. Peristalsis is forcing the feces into the rectum, and that stretching triggers what we call the defecation reflex. And here's the whole process as a whole. In response to taste, smell, or even the thought of food, our gastric juices start churning, right? Have you ever been in a room uh, and then the room next door is making popcorn? Uh, I always just, I used to be a teacher in high school and sometimes the teachers would make popcorn in the lunchroom and I would smell it in my classroom. And that would immediately trigger all my students to say, oh, popcorn, right? I would even be thinking the same thing. It makes your stomach churn. It makes your mouth salivate. That's the first pro step in di the digestive process. Then once you finally eat food, it arrives, and now your stomach's starting to produce gastrin. Gastrin is going to cause the parietal cells to produce hydrochloric acid and stimulate all of the movement and churning um, to increase um, the motility of, of your stomach. Now the chyme is going to enter the duodenum. This is going to trigger gastric inhibitory peptide, turning off the motility of the stomach, turning on CCK and secretin, getting all the digestive enzymes and bile to come into the duodenum, and then VIP, getting those capillaries ready to absorb new nutrients. Then the material is going to start absor being ab absorbed through the jejunum. This is where the majority of nutrient absorption occurs, and all that nutrient is beginning to go to the um, peripheral tissues. Then finally, we get to our large intestine where water is reabsorbed and where our fecal material is compacted and expelled. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Uh, let's talk about some of our accessory structures. Our salivary glands producing saliva, the liver has a number of digestive functions as well as uh, functions with other systems. The gallbladder is storing and concentrating the bile. The bile is actually made in the liver, but stored in the gallbladder. And the pancreas has an endocrine and exocrine function. As an exocrine organ, it is secreting the buffers and enzymes that are needed for digestion. As an endocrine organ, it's secreting insulin and glucagon, like we learned a few chapters ago. Here's the summary of those organs. Let's talk about the liver in more detail. It can synthesize and secrete bile. It can store glycogen and lipid reserves. It's responsible for maintaining normal glucose and amino acid and fatty acid concentrations in the bloodstream. It can also convert nutrient types, so it can convert carbohydrates to lipids. So this is, in other words, why if you eat too many carbs, you're going to gain weight. You can thank your liver for that. Uh, it can act, inactivate toxins. It can store iron, and it can also store fat-soluble vitamins. It's a very fatty organ. It can also synthesize plasma proteins and clotting factors, very important in blood balance and uh, maintenance. It can destroy damaged red blood cells through phagocytosis. The liver has these special cup for cells that are like Pac-Man, kind of like macrophages of our immune system. It can store blood. It can absorb and break down any ho hormones that are circulating in our blood, as well as immunoglobins, our antibodies. And it can also uh, inactivate any lipid-soluble drugs. Saliva is produced by the salivary glands, constantly flushing the surfaces of our oral cavity, keeps our mouth pH right around 7.0, it prevents the buildup of acids by those bacteria, and because it contains antibodies that are going to um, kind of control those bacterial populations. The salivary reflex is triggered by the sight, smell, or even thought of food. That's that smelling popcorn in the next room and your mouth starts watering. That's all controlled through your parasympathetic nervous system. You have three pairs of salivary glands, the sublingual, the submandibular, and the parotid. The sublingual are just underneath the tongue. They have a very mucousy-like secretion. They can be a buffer and a lubricant. The submandibular contain amylase. Um, they're further back in the back of your mouth. 
and these are transporting antibodies into the saliva and they empty into something called the submandibular duct. They're also kind of mucousy. The parotids are uh, more of a watery secretion and they're emptying down towards the back, the top uh, part of the mouth. And again, lots of amylase here as well. So there's the parotids, the submandibulars, and the sublingual. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about the liver more specifically. We talked about its general functions, but let's talk about it as, a, as an organ. It is our largest visceral organ. It can weigh up to 1.5 kilograms. Uh, it's composed of four lobes, the right, the left, the caudate, and the quadrate. The caudate and the quadrate are the smaller lobes um, that you can really only see on the back side. There's a round ligament, which um, is basically rooting it and holding it in place. And the common bile duct is the um, kind of joint duct shared by the liver and the gallbladder going down to the duodenum. Portal hypertension is when uh, that... A uh, hepatic portal vein is carrying nutrient-rich blood from the digestive tract to the liver. There's normal low pressure within this portal system, but if there's blood flow that's restricted for whatever reason, we call it portal hypertension. It's caused by liver infections and degenerative changes over time. Extensive bleeding can be caused from ruptured veins, um, and it may force fluid into the peritoneal cavity, which produces a condition called ascites. Um, and you may have seen these on people. They're basically little lumps in their stomach. It looks like tumors, but it's just pockets of fluid. Um, usually, I'm picturing uh, the few times I've seen them, it's like at the beach or something. It's been on overweight men that are in their late 50s, early 60s, um, you know, with the typical beer belly, and then you see these random bulges. Those are ascites, and that's because of improper uh, portal. Uh, blood pressure. Here you see the lobes. You can see that uh, falciform ligament uh, and the common bile duct coming off of the gallbladder and liver. You can pause the video here, go back and review. Let's talk about that gallbladder. It's a pear-shaped organ. It's hollow. It's storing and concentrating the, bu the bile. Um, the bile comes from the right and left hepatic ducts from the liver and they connect in the common hepatic duct and the bile can then flow um, from the gallbladder through the common bile duct or through the cystic duct to go to the gallbladder. So it, it can either go directly from the liver into the duodenum or it can go through the cystic duct to the gallbladder. The common bile duct meets the pancreatic duct. It's something called the duodenal ampullae. And the hepatopancreatic sphincter is going to encircle that duodenum and allow the flow of bile into the duodenum only at mealtime. So it's just there to squirt the bile into the duodenum to help with that emulsification process. Here you see the gallbladder, the ducts, etc. The cystic duct going to the gallbladder, common hepatic duct, right and left, and that common bile duct coming down from the cystic duct and common hepatic duct to our, um, you can see it better here, our hepatopancreatic sphincter or the duodenal ampullae, just a kind of enlarged opening and then the sphincter muscle there controlling the release of the bile into the duodenum. The pancreas lies posterior to the stomach. It extends laterally. Uh, it's connected by, to the connective tissue by pancreatic lobules, and the exocrine secretions flow into the pancreatic duct through the duodenum. These are all of the uh, enzymes and buffers. We call it the pancreatic juice. The pancreatic duct meets the bile duct at the duodenal ampullae, so it uses that same little hole. Here you see it. Um, the uh, ampullae in the same area, our pancreatic duct, coming this way. The main pro, uh, pancreatic enzymes are pancreatic alpha amylase, which is our carbohydrates, continuing the breakdown and digestion of carbohydrates. There's a lipase, which breaks down lipids, a nuclease to break down RNA and DNA, and proteolytic enzymes, which break down proteins. Uh, these would be things like uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, uh, carboxypeptidase, those are all pancreatic enzymes. And you can pause the video here, go back and review this section. Let's talk about disorders of the oral cavity. Periodontal disease, this is the most common cause of losing teeth. This is when that plaque builds up between the teeth and gums. Gingivitis can lead to periodontal disease. This is the inflammation of the gums um, due to bacterial and tooth decay. Not a very pretty picture. Look at how red and inflamed those gums are. Those of you who are going to be dental hygienists, you're probably 
wanting to clean these teeth. Uh, lots of bacteria, these, this person did not take very good care of their teeth. There's also mumps. This is a salivary gland disorder. Um, it's caused by a virus, infection of the salivary glands, most often the parotid salivary glands. Uh, typically occurs in the ages of five to nine. And obviously there's a vaccine for this. You had to have had this vaccine in order to attend public school. It's part of the MMR vaccine that we all get. Uh, but you can see this person um, unfortunately has mumps in their parotid gland, very uncomfortable disease. Uh, or illness, really. It's not a, not a disease. Uh, esophagitis is the inflammation of the esophagus. This usually comes from some type of um, reflux disease where that uh, cardiac sphincter is not working properly and the stomach acid can creep up into the esophagus and um, really cause pain and erosion in the esophagus and inflammation. The gastroesophageal reflux is that backflow of stomach acid in the esophagus. It's, it's heartburn. There you see that inflammation. You can see it's red and irritated in this uh, endoscopy image. You also have liver disorders like he uh, hepatitis. Hepatitis is the inflammation of our liver. It can be caused by excessive alcohol or by infection. Cirrhosis is hepatitis that's characterized by the dying of liver cells, and it leads to scarring. Uh, the result is declining liver function, and if you remember all those functions of the liver from blood to enzyme balance and vitamin storage. Um, you really need a healthy liver in order to live a healthy life. Hepatitis A, B, and C can be caused by viruses. The virus will attack and destroy blood cell or liver cells, and it overall causes an inflamed liver and a very high fever because your body's trying to fight off this infection. Jaundice is the buildup of bilirubin, which causes the yellowing of skin and eyes. And this happens because that bile is not being taken back up by the liver, but it's floating around in your blood, which is why your skin looks yellow and your eyes look yellow. Here's what a cirrhotic liver looks like, very lumpy, bumpy, and scarred in appearance. Uh, there's also disorders of the gallbladder. Your gallbladder can develop gallstones. Gallstones are crystals of insoluble minerals and salts. Those gallstones can be flushed through the bile ducts and excreted with no problems or they can be very, very large uh, and cause much, much pain as they are passing through. They can cause damage to the gallbladder wall. They can actually block the cystic duct or the common bile duct. There's no effect on bile production in the case of having gallstones or cholecystitis, uh, but typically you have to get your gallbladder removed because um, there's too many blockages or too many gallstones built up. Um, gallstones can be caused through, these are, pictures of gallstones. They literally look like little rocks. Um, and there is a hereditary piece to gallstones, but there's also a nutritional and environmental piece. If you eat a very high fat diet, you're more likely to develop gallstones than someone who has a healthy diet. Gastritis is the inflammation of the mucous membrane of the stomach. It usually happens from ingesting drugs like alcohol or aspirin. Severe stress can cause gastritis as well. A peptic ulcer is when the gastric enzymes are eroding the stomach lining. It can happen in the stomach or in the duodenum. 80% of peptic ulcers are caused by bacterial infections. You can treat with uh, cimetidine, which inhibits the acid production, and then the antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection. There you see a gastric ulcer, basically eating away and eroding that mucous membrane. And then the acid would just seep out into your abdominal cavity and eat away at your mesenteries and other organs. Very uncomfortable. Pancreatitis, this is the inflammation of the pancreas. It can be caused by gallstones if they get in, involved in that uh, duodenal ampullae. Viral infections, toxic drugs like alcohol can cause pancreatitis. If your pancreatic cells become injured, it's going to activate lysosomes and those digestive enzymes are activated and released within the cells and basically your pancreas starts digesting itself and about one-eighth of cases death can be death can occur because the lysosomal enzymes are basically destroying the pancreas there you see acute pancreatitis there's also disorders of the small intestine like enteritis this is inflammation of the intestine this can cause diarrhea watery bowel movement. This can be caused by a bacteria called Giardia lamblia. Um, and it is usually in like uh, unclean water. You know, you don't go into a rainforest and just drink the water straight from the stream because Giardia could be in it. Dysentery is the inflammation of the small and large intestine, again, producing diarrhea um, and 
you may have blood and mucus from the irritation in your intestines. Gastroenteritis is the inflammation of the stomach and intestines. It can be viral. It can be caused by a protozoan or parasitic worms. It can be linked to poor sanitation and low water quality, just like dysentery uh, and enteritis. There's the giardia. Uh, large intestine disorders can be colitis, which is the inflammation of the colon. It could involve um, diarrhea or constipation, so it could be one end or the other in terms of extremes. There's also colorectal cancer, which is the most common in people that are over 50. It's highly diagnosed uh, and uh, highly treatable. Risk factors include a diet rich in animal fats and low in fiber, so if you want to try to avoid colon cancer, high fiber, low animal fats. It is it's linked to inheritance as well. Um, if you have the tendency in your genetics to form epithelial tumors, it is possible you could develop colorectal cancer. Uh, the most colorectal cancers begin as something called a polyp, which is just a localized tumor, and then it begins to spread and grow larger. So getting colonoscopies is important so that doctors can watch and monitor your polyps and make sure that they are caught before they metastasize. There's your little polyp, just a little, little, little blip in the inside of your colon. This is the last slide of the chapter. This is our review of all of the uh, last little section. Let me know what questions you have. And um, the next chapter will go into how all of this stuff fits together. So this was just the what. Next chapter we'll look at is the how. It all works together with the process of digestion. So have a great day and let me know if you have questions.